Well, welcome to Stromlo Church. It's great to be back with you after all this time. Uh, welcome to those of you who are gathering at Charles Weston School in person. And welcome to those of you who are at home uh, still watching online and gathering in smaller groups. It's a special Sunday, isn't it, to be able to finally uh, be gathering in this way. But this morning, uh, we're going to be uh, doing what we usually do as we sit under the Word of God, hearing Him speak to us uh, through His truth, the Bible. As we start today, let me begin by praying and committing our time to the Lord. Father, we thank you for today that we can gather as your people. Thank you that you have something special to share with us from, from your word. Lord, may our hearts be receptive and we just commit our time together into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said we are to be like salt. Salt is very tasty. It makes food very tasty. But when salt loses its tastiness, it's useless. It's a bit like eating sand. Yuck. When salt loses its flavour, it's useless and you just throw it away. It's a bit like Rick and his gum. This is Rick. Rick loves chewing gum. And this is Rick's gum. And this is Rick chewing his gum. Yum! Grape gum! It tastes delicious! Rick loves to chew gum. Rick loves to blow bubbles with his gum. Rick loves to blow very, very big bubbles with his gum. Chewing gum is great, but after a while, gum begins to lose its flavour. It tastes less and less like grape, and it tastes more and more like, well, nothing at all. The gum is tasteless. This is Rick spitting the chewing gum out of his mouth. This is the useless gum. It's no good anymore. So this is Rick getting rid of his chewing gum. <clears throat> Salt that's lost its saltiness is no good to anyone. Gum that's lost its flavour is no good to anyone. Christians who don't live like Jesus are no good to anyone. If we love Jesus, we are to be like Jesus. When people look at us, they should see that we are like Jesus. Let's pray that we will live like Jesus. Dear Lord, please help us to stand out for Jesus. Help us to love you with our whole heart and help us to love others. Amen. Hi, my name's Stanton. Today I'm going to do the Bible reading and we're going to read from the Gospel of Matthew and we'll read the first 20 verses. So Matthew chapter 5 starting at verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, 
for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. How do you live a meaningful and fruitful life? Well, there's two vital things that you need. Firstly, you need to know who you are, your identity. Secondly, you need to know your purpose, uh, what you're here for. If you are aware of these two things, your identity and your purpose, uh, then this will lead to a very meaningful and fruitful existence. Jesus, as he comes to us in Matthew chapter 5, he lays out for us the answer to these vital questions. He shows us uh, what it is to be a disciple of Jesus, uh, his followers. He points out our new identity. And then he goes on to show us what it is that we are here for, our purpose. He says in verse 13 that you are the salt of the earth. And verse 14, you are the light of the world. That's what we're called to be and to be this for the glory of God. But before we look at this in detail, let's remember uh, the context of what Jesus uh, has been doing here. In chapter 4, Jesus has begun his ministry and he goes about saying that the kingdom of God is here. It's arrived. And he calls these new disciples. He calls these fishermen and says, follow me. And he gives them this brand new identity. As he calls these disciples, he calls them on the basis of grace. They've done nothing to earn or merit uh, him calling them. But he calls them graciously. And he says, now you are going to be my fishers of men. Now, as he's been uh, doing this ministry, as he's uh, been healing the sick and, and being involved in preaching this good news of the kingdom, a large crowd has gathered and is following him. So what does he do? Well, he goes up onto a mountainside. And classically, uh, it's thought that he then stood and preached to the crowds. But we heard and we saw last week that it's his disciples that he speaks specifically to. As he speaks to his disciples, uh, he lays out who they are and what they're here for. And it's a message that you and I need to hear this morning. And we need to be reminded our identity and what God calls us to be. You see, it's really important to understand this foundation. 
at the beginning of this Sermon on the Mount, he shows us the indicative, what we are before he gets to the imperative, the, the calling or the commands for how to behave. You see, if we go straight to the commands, uh, then we think that uh, we so easily think that Christianity is about rule keeping. It's, it's about religiosity. It's pharisaical um, uh, keeping the letter of the law. But that's not Christianity at all. And in fact, Jesus speaks out against that all throughout this Sermon on the Mount. What we have here is the foundation of who they are and what they are called to. And then as a result, the behavior flows on out of this. So let's get that the right way around first. Now, as Jesus does speak to these disciples, uh, I have in mind the, the idea of, of like a basketball coach who calls his players off the court for a timeout, and he gives them specific uh, instructions as to how to play. Uh, this is, this is a bit like the playbook for the disciples, uh, which the Sermon on the Mount fleshes out. And there in the timeout, uh, those that are on the periphery, they're, they're listening in, uh, they're paying attention, that's the crowd. And here we have the same uh, in this Sermon on the Mount. And what Jesus does first up is he gives these 10 uh, descriptions of what being a disciple looks like. And these are typically called the Beatitudes from verse 3 through to the end of verse 10. Uh, descriptions of those who are kingdom people. Now that this new kingdom of Christ has come in, this is what kingdom people look like. When I was growing up in my teenage years, uh, Christians were joked about as being those who were the ones who wore uh, leather sandals, like Jesus sandals they were called, and, and socks that were pulled up to their knees. Um, that's how you could pick a Christian. Now these days, uh, young people wear the sliders, don't they? It's the, the sliders and the socks, and, and they're not standing out in the crowd at all. That's just the way uh, that the trend is. But here, Jesus shows us what a Christian really should look like. And he shows us that uh, these are the ones who are poor in spirit. These are the ones who mourn. These are the ones who are meek. And in verse 6, those are the ones who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Beatitudes, typically, uh, is the title for these first eight descriptions. But what is a beatitude, really? What, what is this term, beatitude? Uh, it's the title that's not part of the original Bible, but that the translators have put in. Some have thought that a beatitude is a be-attitude. Uh, this is the attitude that we're to have, uh, that we're to be like. But that misunderstands the definition of a beatitude. It's an old-fashioned term for um, what it means to be supremely happy or complete happiness. Happiness really isn't the best translation for this, though. Some translations say happy are those who are poor in spirit. It has more to do with living a flourishing life uh, of contentment and fulfillment. Those who are truly content or live the flourishing life are the poor in spirit, uh, the, those who mourn, those who are meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. But when you think about this, that's a little strange. See, typically when we look at the world around us, we think those who are flourishing, those who are living the contented life, are those who are materially are prosperous, those who uh, everything is going well, not those who are poor in spirit, or those who are, who are mourning, those who are humble or meek. Um, it's the people whose lives are together and that are bold and confident. Uh, they're the ones who live the flourishing life. So what has Jesus got on view here? Well, firstly, he, he has on view an upside-down kingdom that we saw pointed out last week. Uh, his kingdom is unlike the kingdom of this world. But what are these poor? What are these meek? What are these hungry and thirsty people? Well, they are poor in spirit. See, the poverty that's spoken about here isn't a material po poverty or a physical poverty. It's a spiritual poverty. And as these people understand their spiritual poverty, uh, they mourn and they grieve over this. 
and in grieving and mourning over this, the meekness or the humility uh, of coming before their great God. They acknowledge uh, that they're, they're people who hunger and thirst for something more, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. This is actually the very nature of the Christian message, the gospel message found in Christ. For the gospel points out that uh, we are all poor in spirit. We are all spiritual paupers. Uh, in our rebellion and our sinfulness, it has separated us from the very source of life himself, God, our creator. And we need his infilling, well, his spirit uh, to fill us, as it says in verse 6. In fact, as we look at this poverty of spirit in the light of other scripture, uh, there's, there's stronger language that's often used. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says we are dead in our sins. Uh, we are spiritually dead. Here is someone who grieves now over this and who longs and hungers to be brought back into relationship with God for things to be put back right. Friends, that's you and me. That's who the disciples are. Ah, these are people, we are people who acknowledge our spiritual poverty before God and who grieve and mourn over it, who submit ourselves before him meekly and humbly and who hunger and thirst to be put right with God again. Well, what's the result of this type of person? Well, these verses say that the person poor in spirit uh, and they're the ones who will receive the kingdom of heaven. They're the ones who will be comforted that the gospel of Jesus and his atoning death and resurrection brings great comfort for those who mourn. That those who are meek, uh, we will be the ones who in giving over ourselves and humbly submitting to God, we're actually going to inherit the earth. God's going to give us great inheritance that goes on into eternity. And those who hunger to be brought back into relationship with God, we will be filled with his spirit. What great news this is. This is the DNA of a disciple, of a Christian. And it doesn't just happen right then when we first become a Christian. Uh, this description of a disciple uh, is a daily coming before God with repentant hearts saying, God, we need you. God, without you, I am a spiritual pauper. God, please fill me. And bring me and, and, and maintain and keep this, uh, this right relationship with you through Jesus. Well, we then see that uh, he builds on this. And in particular, in relation to the world around us. For he says in verse 7, Blessed are those who are merciful. Blessed are those who are pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. And blessed are the persecuted. Here, in understanding the work of the gospel in their lives, uh, they extend mercy to those around them. And they will be continually shown mercy by God. Uh, they will be known as people who have, uh, have well, will be made pure uh, in heart and therefore have a relationship with God himself. They will see God. Uh, we are to be people who bring the gospel of peace and reconciliation. And in, in result, be known as children of God. And then uh, these are the persecuted ones uh, who are persecuted for the sake of Christ because our Savior himself was persecuted. Here is the DNA, the identity of a disciple, a follower of Jesus. But that's not the only thing that Jesus uh, states out as uh, being uh, what these disciples are all about. He gives their identity and now he goes on to give their purpose. He says in verse 13, you are salt of the earth. And in verse 14, you are the light of the world. Here is a statement that these disciples are to make a difference in the world around them. They're to have an impact. I have the privilege of coaching an under-14s basketball team. And as I coach them and as I give them instructions before the game, I say, go out there and go mad. M-A-D. Go make a difference. See, my call to these young boys is that as they step onto the court, that they won't, won't simply score points, but they'll go and make a difference in every play, whether it's defensively, whether it's uh, uh, chasing the ball down, whether it's pulling down rebounds, uh, whether it's passing the ball, that they can make a difference in every single play. 
Friends, we step onto the court every single day and we're called to make a difference. Here is the illustration of salt. Uh, I've got some salt here. And uh, the description here is, is one where we could, uh, we could be told, we could think that, that salt is about um, bringing uh, flavor or seasoning to something. Now, it could be what Jesus has in mind, but it's more likely that what he has in mind is the idea of preserving things that are decaying. Uh, the, the view that the world around us is depraved by sin. And therefore, as we enter this world with God's goodness, God's good character, his love, his compassion, his mercy, uh, God's holiness, it actually works as a preservative against the wickedness and the depravity of this world. See, we live in a world where we have the, the fortune of refrigeration. Um, meat itself without salt, well, it decays so quickly. And Jesus calls us to go out and be like salt to this world. But there's also a warning here, isn't there? It says, if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Uh, it's no longer good for anything at all, but to be thrown out underfoot. Now, salt, as a, uh, in its chemical properties, it doesn't actually lose its saltiness. Um, but uh, it's, it can be diluted. Now, it's, it was often the case that, that salt was a precious commodity. In fact, the uh, Roman soldiers were known to be paid in salt as a currency. And what could happen is that as it was passed on from one person to another, to make it go that little bit further, it would be often diluted. And as it was diluted further and further, it begins to lose its effect, its, its saltiness, its ability to preserve. Jesus warns us not to lose our saltiness. And it's likely here that what he has in view is that we are to be continually effective into, in the world. Uh, we're not to compromise or to be like the world. We're to stand out and be different to the world. In fact, we, like salt preserves, are to be rubbed into the world and so that it changes and affects the world around us. That's the purpose of a Christian. Now, the Sermon on the Mount actually fleshes out what that looks like uh, in our behavior, and we'll get onto that in future weeks. But ultimately, as we are bringing the gospel of Jesus, it transforms the world around us and has this preserving effect. Well, the second illustration is this one of being the light of the world. Now, we typically know that uh, the light in the darkness is something that um, has a great effect. Uh, you, you only need a small amount of light in a dark room to have a big impact. We're called to live lives uh, that have a big impact. Again, we need to think through how much of an impact are we having on the world around us? Are we like a city on a hill that can be seen? Or are we like a light that's just hidden away under a bowl? for that's worthless. It, it doesn't have much effect at all. See, we're told to let our light shine before others. Now, I play on a basketball team, and my basketball team is actually called Salt and Light. It's a, it's a Christian basketball team. And so as we, uh, I'll put it up here, as we go out onto the basketball court, um, we are called to um, not simply, I mean, I don't, I don't try to make a difference in the way that I play, but I also try to make a difference in uh, my attitude on the court to be a good sport, to be someone who is a Christian witness on the basketball court. And I have to think, would they know that I'm a Christian if I didn't have a Christian label to my jersey and, and to our team? My, my hope is that they would. I wonder if that's the same for you. As you step out onto the court of uh, living your life, uh, do people immediately or over time in getting to know you, do they see that you are different to the world around them? I've heard of uh, a, a friend who uh, uh, I met in Hong Kong who um, suddenly realized after 18 months that they were working on the same desk of another Christian. Uh, all this time, they'd been talking to each other, relating to each other, but it took a whole 18 months before they realized that uh, they were actually working right next to another Christian. Friends, we need to be prayerful and thinking, uh, are we any different 
to those around us. You see, we are to let our light shine. And what does that really mean? Well, Jesus points out at the end of verse 16 uh, that as we let our lights shine before others, that they would see our good deeds and glorify God. What does it mean in the relation to good deeds here? Is it simply just being kind to our neighbor uh, or helping uh, that, that granny across the road? Um, is those the type of good deeds that is on view? Uh, I don't believe so. In fact, I'm convinced that, again, as the Sermon on the Mount expands on this, the good deeds that are on view have stark contrast to how people relate in our world. You see, there's a call to love those who are our enemies. Uh, there's a call to not hold grudges or, or retaliate or be people of anger or resentment. Here is one of being people who are, are generous and not judgmental. This is an upside down kingdom. This is so very different to the way in which people of our world hold grudges, who retaliate, who, who don't forgive, who are so judgmental and uh, are not generous. Friends, this is the call of a Christian to let our light shine. Let our good deeds be visible before others. We've heard of our identity in the Beatitudes of how to be kingdom people and followers of Jesus. We've now heard how it is that we are to be the salt of the earth and to be uh, people who have lights that shine brightly in a dark and depraved world. But what's the purpose of all this? Why does Jesus call us to be like this? Well, the answer there is right at the end of the passage that we're looking at today, at the end of verse 16. He says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good, good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Glorify your Father in heaven. That's what it's all about. See, it's not about making our own selves uh, receive the credit and for us to be the ones who are impressive in, in being different in this world. But in the end, we have a world that is in darkness and is in desperate need of the saving message of the gospel of Jesus. They need to know our great God and in him being seen and known through being us being salt and light, he gets the glory. Now, the other morning, Friday morning, I had the chance of gathering together with um, my men's uh, life group that I'm a part of, and we get together for breakfast. Uh, this week, we we're able to celebrate breakfast together because we were uh, meeting together face to face, and uh, there was great joy in being able to do that again. And I ordered a, a breakfast. It was an egg and avocado breakfast. And as it came before me, it, um, it, it tasted nice, but it wasn't all that great. Uh, then I went and got the salt, put that on the breakfast, on the avocado and the egg, and it tasted delicious. It was so good. Now, as I stepped away, I didn't go on and say, man, that salt tasted so good. No, I went away and said, that avocado, that egg, it tasted so good. Friends, where to be a little bit like this? Uh, where to see that, uh, where to be the salt so that in the end, people say, God is so good. He's the one who is glorified. He's the one who gets the credit and the glory that people might see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. Let me finish by uh, telling you of something that I, I try to do uh, as often as I can. Uh, often I will get the chance to drop my kids uh, at school. And as I drop them at school, um, I try to leave them with a couple of thoughts in their head. Um, one of the things that I will say has to do with uh, their identity. Uh, and I'll say to them, remember whose you are. Uh, I don't say remember who you are, remember whose you are. In the light of the fact that they are children of God. That God has chosen them. That they are loved by God. I want their identity be, to be firmly, wrap, firmly wrapped up in whose they are. That they are God's. 
my hope is that this will then resonate into their day and that knowing that they are, they are loved by God, uh, this will inform their, their behaviour, uh, that they won't need to try and impress or, or please other people because they are God's. The other thing that I'll try and say uh, is in relation not to their identity, but in relation to their purpose. And instead of saying, have a good day, I'll try and say, have a God day. In, in that, I'm uh, encouraging, encouraging them to have a God-focused day or a God-glorifying day or a God-filled day. That as they have a God day, that their, their life and their day will be a purpose, a day that has purpose that is all about God himself, identity and purpose. And my hope is that as this, these thoughts resonate throughout their day, uh, that this will mean that their behavior is impacted by uh, these things. Friends, we've been hearing about our identity as Christians, as followers of Jesus. And we've been hearing about our purpose, uh, what we're called to be, that we're to be salt and light so that God will be glorified. My prayer is that this will now go on to inform your behavior. This will now impact the way you step onto the court, the way that you live your life. We're going to hear more of this in the call to be people uh, who obey Christ in much of the Sermon on the Mount, in this radical kingdom, upside down kingdom that he presents for us as the weeks go by. But for now, my prayer is that you'll be able to take these truths and apply them to your life. Why don't we close in prayer after our time together? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for calling us unconditionally by grace to be your children. Lord, we thank you that we can be your followers and your disciples, even though we are poor in spirit, even though our hearts mourn and grieve over our sin, even though uh, there is a great hunger and thirst for righteousness. Lord, through your gospel and through the person of Jesus, you fill us afresh by your spirit and you make us anew. Lord, thank you also for not leaving us in the dark, but for giving us purpose. Now, you call us to go and make a difference, to go and have an impact on this dark world around us. Lord, thank you that you've given us uh, the words of eternal life to declare and proclaim to a world in need. Lord, we ask that our lives would stand out, that we wouldn't be uh, just like the world around us, but we would be so very different that we would have an impact, that people would see our good deeds. And as they do, they would glorify you, giving you the praise and the glory and the honor that you deserve. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Good morning, Stromlo Church. My name is Harrison. I'm a member and the youth coordinator of Ultimate, the youth group. Um, I'm just going to lead us in prayer this morning, if you'll join me. Lord, we pr praise you for the joy of being able to gather together in person. We acknowledge that this isn't an easy task, so we thank you for those from our staff, council, church family, and all those who have put in time and effort planning and coordinating these gatherings, Lord. We've been greatly encouraged by these meetings and pray that more people will continue to attend each week. Lord, we also pray for those who are feeling disconnected or are drifting in their walk with you over the recent months. Please show them your love and peace. Remind them that you are the same God now as before and ever will be. And help us as a church family to love and support those who are lost, anxious, tired or hurting. Father, we pray for our country, particularly the state of Victoria. We pray for the, that the people of Melbourne and the surrounding regions will make the right decisions, not only for the sake of submission to authority as you command us, Lord, but out of love for one another. We ask that you will heal those who are ill and comfort those who are feared and frightened. Help us also to make the right decisions here in the ACT to keep everyone safe. Lord, we thank you for the youth and children's ministry of Stromlo Church. Please be with the ultimate leaders as we head back into Term 3 this Friday. Help us to reach those who, are, who feel disconnected and support those who are fearful. We thank you for the blessing of Ultimate Camp, and although it may look a little different this year, we pray that it will be a great time for friendship, faith, food, fellowship and good fun. We pray also for Jen and the children of Stromlo. 
It's a hard thing to organise children's ministry in these times, so we pray that you'll give her wisdom to make the right decisions so that the children of Stromlo can continue to know and hear about you. Finally, Lord, we bring before you everything else in the life of this church. We pray for Marion Guy. Please heal her after her recent fall. Thank you for Connor Sproul's safe return and help him as he gets stuck back into life here in Canberra following his time abroad. And we finally thank you for the Avis family. Lord, thank you that they've had a recent break and we pray for safe travels and rest as they return. And Lord, I pray as Paul did in his letter to the church in Ephesus, that according to the riches of your glory, you may grant us strength with power through your spirit so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we being rooted and established in love may have strength to comprehend all with all the saints, the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to you who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to you be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.